can we have the slide? Thank you so much, Chairperson. For your affectionate, a little bit more elaborate and exaggerated introduction as well. <laughs> And thank you to Party Sabha also for coming, eh? coming so quickly, <laughs> where it takes quite a while. <laughs> Good afternoon, dear friends. In the next 15, 20 minutes, uh, what I'm going to tell you is fundamentally my own perception where we are going in the field of non-communicable disease. So, uh, what has been happening in this area in my own lifetime? We look at it, non-communicable diseases. And I must tell you, in our country, communicable diseases have not yet vanished. They are there, which I'll come down, down the line. If you look at it, this is a paper that we published more than two decades back. And this was one, one of the first papers where we showed that, yes, obesity is coming and is coming in a very big way. And the first time we showed that our women are thicker than men. And many people did not believe it. Uh, like my chairman, they thought in the heaven, women are probably more burqa bound and home bound, which is not the story at all, <laughs> neither then nor now. Uh, but I thought it was some form of a local phenomena. Uh, then thereafter, you know, we studied another population, which is a much younger population, that was 40 and above. We found out that takeoff for this obesity was much earlier. You know, we thought that after 40, that so-called what we had been taught and which, what we had taught, some middle-aged superior people relaxing a bit, you know, we were residency ka program, you don't have to run around, you sit on chairs. Then we found out in 20s, it was already started taking off. In fact, we published a paper after this, we're looking at uh, body mass quartiles from 5 to 15. And we started, it has started changing from the fifth birthday onwards. And that's one thing that wasn't there. When I was in the medical school, I do not remember a single Humpty Dumpty student. There was a guy, you know, recently, our own batchmates created a WhatsApp uh, batch of 1971-76. And uh, somebody uploaded a photograph when uh, that annual convocation me, another fellow, his name is also Hamid, the consultant in Harvard Medical School now, and the professor of uh, pathology, the professor of surgery in that photograph. So I told this guy, Hamid, we look grossly you know, deprived human beings, even in a, so, so thinned out, so, you know, oh, till I did my uh, DM, my weight was 68. So imagine now seeing those 80 kilo youngsters with PCOD today. And there's a global group known as Non-Communicable Diseases Collaboration Group. Uh, we have been working together for more than a decade. And this group is being monitored from Harvard uh, University and Imperial College London. A lot of global data that all many of us had published, hordes of workers had published, was restructured so that it could be made into a format where some proper decisions could be made, deductions could be made. And this is a paper that Argood published in Lancet uh, 2016. The data was till 2014. And what did we find out? Let us look at us. Forget about the rest of the world. 2075, even that time we were a reasonably populous nation. And now that we are now only a populous nation, we worked very hard to be where we are. <laughs> a billion guys over a period of a century. We were at position number 19, our men. What would that mean if we look in terms of absolute number of obese people, right? Even a country like Ukraine had more obese guys than us there. Can you beat it? Even a country like, you know, Poland, more obese people. Today we have, we are at position number five. We are the fifth we have the fifth highest population of obese men today in the world. This has happened in the last 40 years. And if this wasn't sufficient, look at our women folk. They are doing even better than us. They were also at position number 19 in 1975. But today, 
after China and United States, we have the third highest number of obese women in our country. And this has happened rather fast in the last two, three decades. Now look at diabetes. All of you know we have been ad nauseum looking at the epidemiology of diabetes. But this is this hardcore vetted data in Lancet published by the same group. Now look at it. When me and Tripathi Sa were studying medicine for our post graduation, India had 11.9 million diabetics. And by the time we, this data was, you know, this paper came in 2016, but data was, you know, last date of collection was 2014, 64.5 million. And today we know it is almost 80 million today. Now the point is, JJ Mukherjee, the point is that we have not just grown from 11 million to 80 million. That perception is wrong. It is much worse than that. It is not the increase in numbers. When we did that post-graduation, diabetes used to occur at late 40s to early 50s. Life expectancy was 56. All our teachers retired at 54. Right, sir? Am I correct? So whatever that glycemia could do, it would do for half a decade, one decade. Today, the same diabetes occurs at 30, 32, 28, 25. Right, sir? Now, what it means in terms of first getting treatment for half a century, Marte Marte will keep him in ICU for some benefits up and down for a decade. Right? And not only that, the amount of time he loses from education, from job, marriage, discord at home, economic discomfort, going to the lab, going to the doctor, going to the pharmacist for half a century. So it is not just a matter of one into eight. It is many fold millions of life years which are getting worse. And look at this. This another paper that just published on obesity in 2017 in Lancet. Looking at obesity and overweight in children, adolescents, and young adults. Children, adults, and I told you that last paper we published was on 5 to 15 years. And this another paper, population. Again, only looking at children and adolescents. And in fact, you know, this paper was published by the Lancet on World Obesity Day. They brought a special supplement on that day. What does it entail beyond diabetes? Polycystic ovarian syndrome today is the commonest endocrinopathy in women globally. Globally. Not in India today alone. There were hardly any publications on polycystic ovarian syndrome in the 80s when I did my DM. Today, bring any journal, you will have a paper on polycystic ovarian syndrome, IVF, vitamin D deficiency, and genetics and photocytes of tomorrow's talk <laughs> by my elegant friend. And not only that, the same lifestyle. Hordes of these youngsters stuck up with this thing. This, we published this paper in Fertility Sterility. Second commonest cause, polycystic ovarian syndrome. From 12, 13 years only stuck up with a cosmetologist. Get a menstrual irregularity with a gynecologist. 70% of people with polycystic ovarian syndrome have insulin resistance beyond their BMI. So whatever their BMI gives them, it is even worse than that. And this way, you know, these perceptions we do not get. It's happening right in front of us. We practice it every day. Then it translates into infertility. Look at that polycystic ovarian syndrome. One third probably get easily pregnant with the ovulation induction, metformin, blah, blah, blah. 
for another one third we need IVFs today or more advanced technology and costs a ton of money. And everybody is not. One third might still defy a proper child because now people get, they want to get a post-graduation, they want to become the doctorates, they get married at 32, 35. Literally every second person getting uh, GDM and diabetes and wait for a year or two, premature ovarian failure, the story is closed. It started with that change right in the beginning from that fifth birthday when that child started becoming a little bit healthy. Mother's never cells are sick. The same lady gets pregnant, gestational diabetes. Remember one thing, uh, no, whatever the metabolic milieu of the mother, metabolic milieu, dictates the structure of the fetus. If it is not optimal, it dictates how your adipocytes would be in the fetus, how your hepatocyte is going to be, how your myocyte is going to be. So you are ensuring a repetitive epigenetic phenomena. We don't know where it would lead to. This, this is a study that we published some time back. We looked at young women who had early type 2 diabetes from 22 to 30. One third of them had biological evidence of polycystic ovarian syndrome. It means if it had been taken care of earlier, probably even this diabetes would not have occurred or would have been delayed, delayed by a decade or two. This is the worst of the lot. And this is what, as a policy planner uh, and a thinker and a healthcare provider in this country, worries me. This is a paper that our group published just before COVID in Nature. Nature does not Sujai, publish epidemiology papers. They made an exception for this. They said, no, forget about it. Our global, rural, and some urban and some urban areas are, are already destroyed. Look at now the major driver of this body mass index, global epidemic, would come from rural areas. Now imagine the same epidemic going to Indian rural areas. We still continue to be a rural country. You know the amazing healthcare we have in the urban areas. Now Sa was talking, we should have a psychologist, we should have blah blah this. How many, how many people here in this room have a counselor and a dietitian? Sarji, where are you living? How many people have a counselor and a dietitian? How many people? The other day someone came to me. He brought a patient. He said, Daksa, please just go appointment. That, the, the, that so-called other fellow was our chronic patient. I said, it's renal failure. Hai. The guy was living in my neighborhood. We saw him and this, you know, the attendant, you know, his, it was his friend who had pulled him. I said, the doctor ko kabhi nahi dikha hai. So they named a doctor. He said, sir, wo, Blood pressure bhi dekhta hai, nuska bhi likhta hai. He's an endocrinologist, one of my bright students, a DM endocrinologist. He says, sir, wo, I told him, you are not looking at BP apparatus. Yahan baanta And if that happens, now you know where our rural areas are going. Now this is the data from some of our own friends. Shashank Joshi, Sanjay Kalras, Pansi uh, Sabu Sabs, Mohan Sabs. Yeh humare country ka already hal hai, itne saare endocrinda. Kisi ne bhi contradiction nahi ki ke humara basic A1C now se kam hai. Kisi ne bhi contradict nahi ki. The other day I saw a lady with an A1C of 18. So maine wai galat yaar dousre se kar lo. Dousre ne bhi 17 diya aur 15 diya. Maine kao 15 ko pakad lo. Budde ko achha dekhna thoda khadre se kaali nahi. I'm not joking. I mean it. And what it would translate into in our country? This is a government vetted data, commissioned by Government of India, who I was a part of. Coronary artery disease has doubled up in the first decade of uh, this century. Karan, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, all, not only they are increasing, but they continue to be unattended. Like my brilliant student, blood pressure, shh, shh, shh. because you're waiting for another patient, another 500 bucks. 
or we are looking for the counselors, we are looking for the psychologists, the psychiatrists. <laughs> oh no, let us call a spade a spade. I didn't name the guy. <laughs> so this coronary artery disease, I tell you, JJ, when I was doing my MD, there was a book by Ahuja, whom we revere all, which had a chapter that there is no ischemic heart disease in our country, we are immune to it, genetically protected. Rheumatic heart disease, we got all, I got all my distinctions there, MS, MR, AR, <laughs> congenital heart disease, <laughs> fellow tetralogies. Now today, look at this, congenital heart disease, rheumatic heart, stuck up, even in this year, we have our own limitations in this country. But they haven't worsened. Only one thing has worsened, coronary artery disease. This is a paper we published two decades back, maybe even three, where first time I showed that infections kill people, diabetics in this country. Lot many people critiqued. Then I asked it, PJ guys, Anil Bansali published a paper a year later. Infections kill number one, but number two are still at the ground level, kidney failure. We replicated this data a decade later. Now we prospectively looked for the cause of death for next 10 years. People were living longer. Quantum of life was bigger. The gap between the diabetic and non-diabetic was shrinking. But infections were still there. Renal failure was still there. His care is that 9 HbA1c was doing its job. Now what magnitude of renal failure it would entail? When I did my DM, DM, I'm not talking about a magical graduation. The commonest cause of renal failure was chronic glomerulonephrites. Chronic pyelonephrites. Occasional case of polycystic disease of the kidney. IJ nephropathies and other things were never heard of. Diabetes only we had read Camelstein Wilson syndrome. That's all we remember from Boyd and other things. But today, globally, 62% of the kidney disease attributable to Diabetes mellitus. As an administrator, one day, you know, during a kidney day, I was supposed to give a talk as an administrator, so I was looking at some data. I was stunned. Even a country like United States cannot afford dialysis and renal replacement. Cannot. And I was amazed. It was documented. If we use all the renal replacement facilities in this country, you cannot take care of more than 18 to 20 percent of people adequately today. Today, I'm not, and this future ki baat hi nahi hai. Future ki baat hai, I'm talking today. We, one day, Chief Minister and Health Minister asked me this interview. Dr. Saab, what new things you are doing for the NSU? I said, whatever I do, like it goes to the gadde. 100 ke 200 kar do, phir bhi deficient hai. 200 ke 400 kar because the demand is so huge, capacity is so huge, understanding is so poor, planning is so pathetic. Why do we reach? All of us know, throughout our lives, I'm talking about people, and I see of that cadre only Tripathis have here, and maybe a couple of guys who are somewhere <laughs> a decade or so around the corner. All along, a hepatic failure would mean hepatitis B. And in fact, I was the first person who says a non A, non B hepatitis also is like hepatitis B. The first paper published in Hepatitis Memorandum in 1981, my postgraduate thesis, presented in Calcutta, got the first award of my lifetime in 1981. <laughs> now, today, you'll be amazed to know hepatic disease because of metabolic origin, the commonest is globally, including India, and the commonest cause of Hepatic replacement. And this is a paper that we published in Nature only last week. The same group. Whatever benefits the youngsters in, in half a century back had by moving to the urban areas. Paramala me Srinagar chale jao, Srinagar se Delhi chale jao. It has come to a dead end. There are no benefits there now. Economy, look at it. This is US, this is China. This is the money we have for diabetes. Even Germany has more. Our neighbor, bichare ka hal us din bhi aisa hi tha. 
क्योंकि दिखता नहीं है वहां पे नो विद दिस मनी हु ट्रीट्स होम आई लाइक विद दिस मनी हु ट्रीट्स होम अपने मुल्क को बाढ़ में जाने दो बाकी को अपना देखो एंड एक्सपेंडिचर इज इंक्रीजिंग एवरी सेकेंड इन कैन सी इट so this is where we are landing when i did my doctoral studies the biggest problem that hit my brain was iodine deficiency when who discussed it uh, in new delhi on shura medical sciences in feb 1984 i spent two decades to get eradicate that iodine deficiency eradicated now this is the challenge for the newer generation that we have identified the problem is today tripathi sahab हमने तो मसले बता दिए हाल तो इन लोडो को अब ढोड़ना है <laughs> हम साथ साथ हैं थैंक यू सो मच